ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to have you join me again tonight on Livingston's Ledger. I have a great uh, into, an author to introduce to you this evening. Um, we all know the story of It's a Wonderful Life. It's a theme of doing the right thing, and it can be a difficult thing, but ultimately the reward is realized in how much your goodness and kindness has touched so many. My dear friend Caroline knows this to be true, and I'd like to quote her. Being a leader is not about the title, it's not about the rank, but the deed and the sacrifice you make for people. The ability to listen, the ability to amplify good in people and for the people. Whether it's colleagues, friends, family, and even strangers, in a wonderful way, it was doing our it was during our stage performance of this timeless classic. I had the good fortune and the privilege of meeting Caroline many, many years ago. We have stayed friends all of these years, and her stories have become so inspirational, I was compelled to share them with you. Uh, Caroline is a teacher, a poet, an author, an actress, a director, and all of these experiences, her goodness continues to inspire. Presently a full-time teacher at Thayer Academy, a mentor at Brown University, and giving inspirational presentations and speeches in many venues. She will be the commencement speaker at Brown University in this year's graduation. And now I'd like to introduce you to Caroline. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, Tell me, why don't you share with us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, why you chose to come to America. Okay, so I am originally from Malawi, Africa. It's southeast of Africa, neighboring Mozambique, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, about a two hour flight up north from South Africa. So I lived there for 17 years of my life. I went to Kamuzu Academy, which is a private academy uh, for high school, and I started high school at nine years old. I know, a little different. <laughs> uh, but I was yeah. excited to do this, and um, when I finished my high school, I came to the United States for primarily for education, mm -hmm. and I went to Quincy College, studied liberal arts, went to UMass Boston and Brown University, studied English, and then finally Emerson College, where I studied creative writing. I love it. What inspired you to be a writer? So, the first thing you have to know is, I never used to be a very good writer when I was in high school. Um, in fact, I failed English almost every single semester. And when I moved to America, something happened. I loved literature so much that I would work on it during my free time, but I also helped a lot of my school friends um, at Quincy College in the cafeteria. I would do this extra work on the side. And very quickly, a teacher noticed that I was doing this, and they decided to hire me as a writing tutor. It was one of my first wow. few jobs in the United States of America. And after that, I, when I was 27 years old, I'm a college professor, and I'm feeling empty. So I decided, you know what? I need to go back to Malawi. Mm -hmm. And once I was around the people, and the village, and the culture, I started writing. I wrote about my experiences, and I would document them, share them on social media, and people said, write a book. Then I became an author. So uh, you are a multifaceted person with being a professor, a teacher at their academy, a mentor at Brown University. And I know you as an actress, uh, your poetry, and now I hear you're directing a play at the school. But how do these different occupations shape what you write about? Okay. I always try to share a unique perspective because I'm an outsider. I'm from Malawi, living in the United States of America, so I always have the outsider's perspective, so to speak. And that's important to me. And I also realize that a lot of my occupations have to do with helping other people find their voices and helping other people express themselves. My students, you know, uh, mentoring mm -hmm. at Brown right. University, all of this kind of, um, is something that I always have at the back of my mind when I write. How can I help this person? How can I share knowledge? How can I cure ignorance? How can I raise awareness? So that's how it kind of affects I, my I, writing. I think that's wonderful. Now you've written two books. Uh, what 
kind of girl, and the second book is some kind of girl. Um, what are some of the things that you want people to take away from after they've read your book? They'll learn a lot about the risks that I took um, as somebody that was on a journey for self-discovery. They'll learn a lot about what I was thinking when I was navigating different personalities, different people um, in the United States because it's a different culture. So I had to learn how to adapt so they can learn my interiority, the way I was thinking and processing America. A little bit of culture shock, a little bit of familiar things that I watched on television when I was in uh, Africa. So they'll learn about that. And uh, more importantly, my fears and my insecurities as somebody who wasn't always comfortable in mm. her body, somebody that didn't always fit into um, social norms, society's norms. Mm. So it, this is a great book for like outsiders, people who don't always fit in. And what do you think it means for other women now that you've written your memoir and your life story? I think it encourages a lot of women to share their stories. I think that my story gives a voice to the voiceless or people who don't have the space to you know, articulate what they've gone through. And I think a lot of women too who may have experienced similar experiences to mine will not feel alone anymore because my story exists. So I think my book is, both my books are a light, so to speak. They're a guide for other women to write their own narratives to say, look, I am here, I exist, I matter, and my story is important too. Now, Caroline, you know my son Brendan aspires to be a successful writer like yourself. It's his dream, and so my next question to me is, to you would be, uh, what advice can you give Brendan and young men and women who aspire to become writers? And like, uh, the first thing that what I would say was, how do you come out about to get an agent and things like that? How, how were you able to to so, get through those barriers? Okay, so I'll start with the advice very quickly. Okay. Figure out what your truth is and articulate that truth as best as you can, as honestly and as raw as you can. Um, explore language, right? Because I think as people who write stories, we create worlds. Like I said, we're sharing knowledge, we're curing ignorance, we're raising awareness. I think it's a noble thing to be able to write stories about ourselves, especially since I'm a memoirist, um, and to help people grow, to show them that there are different parts of the world uh, and you know, in our differences, we can still find a way to kind of unite. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, um, I don't have an agent. Wonderful. I went straight to the publisher. So um, that exists too, that's the first thing that I will say, and he'll have to think about that. Does he want an agent, or does, um, does he want to kind of just go straight to a publisher? And those are both good pathways. Um, mm. I do a lot of the work myself, um, advertising, putting myself out there. You know yeah. what I'm like, you I go do. on social media, and yep. it's there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the other thing is that, like my advice to Ben, I do writing and he does, and uh, I said to him, take a, a real life experience, and if you need be, take that experience, but then exaggerate it and add to it and stuff like this. <laughs> and I find that he's pretty good at it. So yeah. uh, I'm anxious for him to you know, move on with it. I keep you know, encouraging him, do it. Uh, the next question is from your own words, uh, a quote from you, I just want to find out what happens if I don't give up. Obviously, you didn't give up, so what happened? Well, success. In, up, up, in my journey towards where I am today, I have f failed, too, along the way. But I'll tell you that the lessons that you get from failure, the reward is success, right? Stumbling blocks are not the stoppage. That's not your destination, right? right? And when you don't give up, you never know who you can become. You may know who you are, but n you may not know what you may become. That's kind of like a Shakespeare quote that I'm uh, trying to quote a little bit. <laughs> um, and I believed in that. I believed in myself, and my persistence has got me to where I am today. 
and I'm so grateful that I have this thing inside of me, whatever it is. I can't quite describe what it is exactly, but I'm glad I have it. I never give up. Does I'm that ins excitement inside of you also come with um, what is it like to prepare for giving your first commencement speech for Brown? Yes. So the commencement speech is for Bay State Bay College. State, which is affiliated with Brown? Um, Brown University is going to be the regalia I'm wearing because it is the school that uh, I went to, I'm very proud of. And um, Bay State College, I'm, I'm preparing a very good speech and I think I would like to give hope for a new beginning for the next chapter that these students are having. And it's such an honor to know that um, I was chosen for something like that, so. And I see you wearing the Thayer Academy regalia tonight, and I'm yes. very proud. I grew up in the South Shore, and I think that's a wonderful thing to promote uh, the wonderful uh, institutions we have. Uh, from another one of your quotes, uh, I was wondering, what were you thinking here? Um, my time spent uh, planning um, to my faith, my family, my friends. I want to ask you, what were you thinking when you made this quote? The older I get, the more I realize that the things that cost nothing hold the most value. Material things, I'm way past that. I realize that it's the time that you spend with people when you are present with them. It's the people that you show up for, right? All of little tiny things like that are what really means something at the end of the day and that the materialistic things wear out, they get old, they disappear, they get lost, but you know, the memories that you create with people are so important. The relationships that you create with people are so important. And so one day I was kind of thinking about that. I was like, what's really important to me at the end of the day? You know, what, what makes me feel fulfilled? What's meaningful to me? And I realized it was the connections that I have with the different people that I know. It's how I make them feel. People will always remember that, right? Um, as opposed to um, just worrying about money and worrying about all these, you know, superficial things. But it's also uh, like, uh, uh, to go back to how I opened the thing, it's, it's like the theme of It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. I know that you've touched a lot of people and we each touch another person that touches another person that touches another person, but we never realize uh, how important it could be. We don't even know, as a teacher, uh, I I've taught as well as you, middle school children, and the important thing that I find is you want to leave the profession hoping that you made an impact. And when I retired from um, Quincy Public Schools this past uh, October, it was funny because all of the kids that I had met, kids that had graduated and gone on to high school came back to see me. But some of the toughest kids that you wouldn't see shed a tear were like, why are you doing this to us? So. I would have to say that uh, I see that in you, that you've touched so many people's lives. Mine is one of them, and that's why I, I always want to keep in touch with you, and I, I was hoping that you would come up and do this interview with me, and I'm happy that you did. How do you feel as a professional and in, in, in a mentor and inspirational speaker that you have impacted people's lives? It feels wonderful. It's my purpose. I feel like I was born with something that wants to give a life of service. It's, it's the life that I want to live. And every single time that I move people, every single time that I make an impact, help people find out who they are, um, I feel like I am living within my purpose. And I always say, when somebody operates within their purpose, they don't have to sit at the head of the table. The table shifts with you because you are in your purpose. And if I am to leave a legacy in my life, it's the legacy of impact. It's the impact that I've had on other people. Um, I want that positive impact. That's the legacy I want to keep, and it feels good that I'm in that path of doing that. Well, I saw a lot of that uh, with um, the interaction that you had with uh, when we were in sta on stage and we'd go back to the green room. Uh, you know, you had a way of getting along with everybody and everyone got along with you. We all had such a wonderful time so that impact is a very positive thing. And um, especially in times when people might be down, we don't know what they've been through that day, but to come in and then all of a sudden have a smile or have them say to you, 
wow, you just made my day, because yes. we have no idea what it is, and I think you have been a, a powerful impact to so many people that I know, that you know, Thank uh, you. In the, on the stage. <clears throat> uh, another, um, if you think, this is one of a quote from you, if you think you are this, uh, too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. <laughs> now I find uh, you know it's an African proverb, but I find that uh, you've made a you've made a di big difference in a lot of people's lives in your traveling. Why don't you share with us a little bit about your travels to um, promote your book and why? Okay, so um, I share a lot on my social media, and I feel like the word of mouth has been something that has helped me promote this book. But I also try to find creative ways of marketing myself uh, and putting myself out there. So I do things like create a press release that I send out to different organizations, different media, um, and I go in and I do things like what I'm doing right now and the word gets out. Um, I go to libraries and I've shared copies of my book that the library can have and as a result, most libraries ask me to give an author talk. Um, I just gave an author talk at uh, Tufts Library in Weymouth. Um, the next one that's coming up is Thayer Public Library in Braintree. So these are all great opportunities and I go to schools and give these talks as well, inspiring young kids, um, you know, kids who want to write, kids who just love nonfiction uh, and hearing about you know, uh, foreigners like myself who come to a new country uh, and start to adapt to the American culture from scratch. So it's it's been exciting. Um, and I feel like I'm slowly growing um, in all my efforts that I've done, and okay. it just feels good. Now, do you have, uh, I'm not gonna put you on, I, I'm, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but do you have a poem that you would like to recite? Or <laughs> you have? A poem that I would like to recite. That, I know you're a poet, so I wondered if there was something that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a poem that I want to recite right now, but I will tell you a little bit about the type of poetry okay, that, I, that I'm writing. Um, things that have to do with women's empowerment, identity, social justice, that's what I really want to get out there. Think Amanda Gorman. She really kind of, she, not kind of, she really inspired me. Um, after that inauguration uh, poem that she did. And after that, I said, I could do the same thing. I could write things that uplift not just America, but also my country, Malawi. Um, I find a way to bridge the gap between Malawi and America. Um, and I also love to share a little bit about what it's like to either be embraced by America or to be alienated by America, and the similar thing happens in my country, Malawi. I go there and people say, you're not from around here, and I said, <laughs> I, I am from it's around here. Same thing happens in different neighborhoods. You yes, know, you know, and some people embrace me, so um, I kind of live in this space where home is no longer like a geographical space, but home becomes the people that I meet, mm. right? They create the feeling of home for me. Right, so I write about things like that in my poem, my poems, and um, it's 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 fun. <laughs> now, in the acting field, uh, I, I have two part question. The first one is, um, how many how many productions did we do together? <laughs> Was it? I know I did over 120 of uh, A Christmas Carol and probably about 100 of the. Right, uh, uh, because we did we It's a Wonderful together? Life. We we did a we did two. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. So that was, what experience you have in the? You know, I know you're now directing. You want to give us a little information about your yes. directing experience? Um, I'm directing my first show at Thayer Academy. Um, with uh, director Kelly Hines, who works there, and you're familiar with her through we, company theater. We were theater. on stage together too. Yes, and um, uh, I'm the co-director. Yeah. So she's given me a wonderful opportunity where I direct some of the scenes, and you know, it's just nice to see the production come together. The kids at their academy are wonderful. They're willing to try things. Um, they say yes to uh, things that 
you know, some kids might say, I'm a little shy about this, or I don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. These kids, you tell them what to do, and they're just willing to try it at least once. Right. Uh, and if it works out, we take it and move forward. Oh. So I'm having a good time. I know what that's like, because uh, when we worked together at <clears throat> the company theater, uh, Jody Sossman, who was the director, would say, Richard, I want to give you lines. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No, no, you can do it. And then the next show was another line. And then the next show, was, and before you know it, uh, I had my own part. And it was uh, ex an experience, but I will say this: if it wasn't for your production crew, in stage, in acting, and here at the studio, I mean, they make us look really good, don't they? Yes, <laughs> they do make us look very, very good. Okay. And I'm so glad that I got myself a theater family yeah. um, that I can lean on. And um, I came here, believe it or not, to be an actress. That was yeah. supposed to be my primary job, and you know. As way leads to way, sometimes you end up in a yeah. profession that you never saw coming. But I still do a little bit of this acting stuff, and uh, I love it. I prefer to be on stage. I used to want to be on TV, but yeah. stage is just a better option for me. I love the spontaneity of it, the immediacy mm -hmm. of things. Um, do and you have a plan for something in the future for stage? Do I have a plan for something in the future? I'm not quite sure. Right now, these books, are my children, and I need to take care of these. Um, I just did Measure for Measure by William Shakespeare okay. um, at MMAS in Mansfield, so that was very good. I just finished that production, so now I have to give attention to the books. Right. So after that, maybe I'll get back on stage, but for now, um, I have to do a lot of marketing and a lot of these author talks and interviews. Yeah. So. It's, a, it's an interesting... Um uh, experience to, especially in light of the fact that you're doing all the promotion uh, and preparation yourself, right. um, and to be able to get out there. Do you? I know at some point in times you have had anxiety. How do you overcome it with going to all these different places? <clears throat> the first thing I like to tell people is to work on that insecurity and not worry about what other people have to say. You have to put yourself out there. I have never been very shy about doing that. As a matter of fact, a lot of my success comes from networking, mm -hmm. telling people that, oh, I can do this thing, and then who knows, one person knows another person that can help me in the field that I'm looking for, in the thing that I want. So. Yes, sometimes I get into my head and I said, and I say, isn't this too much? Like, aren't people tired of me? But that repetition, repetition is partly a way of marketing, hmm. right? And people show up for me. People start to believe in me. My Twitter family belie believes in me. So a shout out to my Twitter family because they support me in everything. How many followers? Mm, 4.9? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's wonderful. I've that's almost wonderful. reached 10K at this point. Nice. You that's know, wonderful. still building. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes. Um, do you uh, think you're going to move beyond being a memoirist? Memoirist, my apologies. That's okay. Uh, and um, what would you would you like to write a novel of any kind, any specific okay. genre that you're interested in? So after my book of poetry, um, it would be nice to do a, a book of short stories. I can see myself doing that. Um, I, when I was at Emerson College, I studied flash fiction, oh. and that flash fiction, it could be a 100-word story, um, you know, just little tiny snippets uh, with a nice narrative arc to it as well. Uh, I learned the craft very well. I I'm glad add. you brought that up because in yeah. reading your, you know, background information for the preparation for this, I saw flash fiction. I didn't know what is flash fiction. I had never heard of the genre before, but yes. now I see it. it's a lot like flash dance and flash, you know. Yes, just micro little mini stories, and uh, my favorite is um, 100 word stories where each story is 100 words. You wow. know, there are some 500 word stories, so those are like the flash kind of fiction, and, and they have all the elements um, yeah. of story writing, so it's not like you're just writing out a paragraph that doesn't really have any message. Um, it's, it's strategic, it's a craft that you really have to hone into it and um, help people kind of understand what you're trying to get across. So I enjoy mm -hmm. it tremendously. Okay. So I see myself publishing a book of short stories okay. um, at some point. And then maybe 
a third book because this is supposed to be a trilogy. Okay. So first, second, and then a third one. Do you want to give us a tip on what the title might be? <laughs> that kind of girl. It seems. To, it seems. To, oh, I see. So we throw the hat in the air for that girl. Uh, yes, you know. Like um, the old movie. But I need to live a little more life and mm -hmm. change a little bit. So mm -hmm. maybe when I'm in my fifties or so. It would be nice to kind of come up with a third book. I would have changed tremendously compared to these two books. Well, it's a great experience to be able to put your life in, in writing. And as you explained earlier, out there uh, in the public domain, you don't know how it's going to be um, perceived. But I cannot see anything other than all positive feedback coming your way. Um, Thank you so much. From having to work with you on stage, uh, professional and in a personal m nature in the community as a friend. Uh, I, I think you have a lot to offer the children of today and uh, I'm happy to and honored to know you and I'm glad that I had this opportunity to do this interview with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's yep. been a pleasure. Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, talk on? I'm more than happy to give you a few moments to speak to uh, Westford audience. And well, to the Westford audience, um, I would just say these are my two books, What Kind of Girl and Some Kind of Girl. Uh, the first one, What Kind of Girl, is about not fitting into cultural norms um, and how I struggled in Malawi because I wasn't a very passive girl. I wasn't a very uh, passive and submissive and shy girl and some kind of girl is a book that is about adapting to American mm -hmm. culture so these books can be uh, purchased at Austin Macaulay Publishers website uh, Amazon they can be found there Barnes and Noble they can be found there too so um, yes please read my book and I hope that you enjoy them and are there ways if um, a young person saw this interview and wanted to reach out to you you send you a little note or something like that. Is there some way they could do that? Absolutely. You can look me up on LinkedIn. I have a lot of my professional information there. Um, and I also work at Thayer Academy. So there's a lot of my information. My email is um, on the website. And my phone number uh, for work, too, is on the website. And Twitter, I'm also on Twitter. So if you just uh, search my name, you can find me there. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I try to really get out there. So those are all options that you can use to uh, find me. Great. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to take this time to thank our guest, Caroline, and the production crew, and uh, you, the audience, that has helped to continue to make Livingston's Ledger a success. Mm -hmm.